Tonight, I want to take our collective time. I wonder how many people have had to wrestle with God. You've had to wrestle with God. Well, let me say it strong, more strongly. How many have been disappointed by God? Amen. God has, in your, in your sense, let you down. He didn't come through for you. It's probably something you wouldn't readily say out loud. Sounds very unspiritual. That God has disappointed you. God has let you down. He hasn't come through like you hoped he would, believed he would, thought he would. Well, you're not alone. The Bible has stories in it of people who didn't feel like God knew what he was doing who felt let down by the deity, who felt abandoned, who felt confused, who felt that God wasn't there when they needed him. Particularly if it's something major, something that's not just a run of the mill, but something that was uh, terribly significant. And you felt God was just not there for you. Of course, this is the question of Job. He wanted to know why do the righteous suffer? He didn't understand. And even his friends couldn't help him out. Trying to figure out why he was suffering. the truth would be told me and God have been wrestling me and God have been wrestling with why he took sister Evans at this particular point when there was so much prayer so much expectation so many signals of healing and things went in the other direction so the reality is most, if not all, have those times in our lives when we struggle with God. When the statement that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts becomes very real in your situation. Because in light of what happened, he sure wasn't thinking what you were thinking. And his ways sure wasn't the ways that you had planned things to work out. So these are real questions. One biblical writer, one biblical author who raised this question that I've mentioned from time to time is the prophet Habakkuk. Three chapters of this minor prophet if your pages get stuck together in the Bible, you'll miss it. <laughs> For it's only a couple of pages in the Bible. I would tell you it comes after Nahum, but that won't help many of you. <laughs> it comes right before Haggai, and that would help, won't help many of you either. But between Nahum and Haggai is the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk gives us some of his sentiments in verse 2 of the first chapter when he says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Anybody feel him here? His question is, how long do I have to pray about this? Talk to you about this? Plead with you about this? And heaven is silent. 
He has a question in verse 2. He says, why? His first question is, how long? Now his question is, why? Why do you make me see iniquity, cause me to look at the wickedness, yet destruction and violence are before me? Strife exists, contention arises. He wants to know first how long, and now he wants to know why. Isn't that our question? Why? Why? I asked that question today, actually. Not only did, you know, why did you take Sister Evans? But why in one of the exams wasn't it discovered earlier so it could have been dressed earlier? That was a why too. I mean, we, we get these exams every year. Why wasn't it caught earlier? when it could have been arrested. So you ask why. So he says, how long? And then he says, why? To show you how infected and affected he was by his confusion. Chapter 3, verse 16, he says, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones. And in my place, I tremble. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress. For the people to rise who will invade us. To make that short, he says, I'm unraveling. I tremble at the outlook of what I see coming. Here's a man, a prophet of God who is hurting deeply. Now the backdrop of this book is God is bringing judgment on his people for their idolatry and their rebellion against him and he's going to use the Babylonians to bring the judgment. And Rebecca the prophet is struggling with, number one, the fact of judgment, and number two, he's going to use people worse than the Israelites to do the judging. And he can't figure out God's thinking. He can't figure out God's perspective. He makes a statement that we've all either heard or said in chapter 3, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In other words, all your talking is not going to be able to figure this out. All your talking, your crying, your weeping, your complaining, and all you got to do is read the book of Job, because that's 42 chapters of talk. And in chapter 42, they are no clearer in their understanding. He's no clearer. He does not know about chapter 1. And he's never told about chapter 1. About why he's in this predicament that he's in. So Habakkuk is struggling with the why question, the how long question, and the not being able to figure it out. And all he can do is be silent. Now, in the secular world, they would offer us a number of suggestions about facing this kind of situation when the world doesn't make sense. Some would encourage us to resignation. That is, well, I just have to accept it 
because there's nothing I can do about my despair. So they resign themselves. What will be will be and that's just how it is. So that's one approach when you're in despair and you don't know your way out of it just to resign and say, huh, that's it. Another approach to dealing with despair and disappointment is detachment. One is resignation. The other is detachment. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to find something to distract me from it. Whether it's amusement, entertainment, whether it's drugs, relationship, whether it was something so that I don't have to think about it because this distracts me. This puts me in another mental zone. Sometimes it's the bed. I just want to sleep so that I don't have to think about it. The problem with detachment is your despair knows how to work around it. It knows how to seep in when those gaps come. It knows how to bring something to mind or somebody say something or do something that brings it back. So you got to keep finding more escape to detach you from the pain of the problem and the difficulty. So some people resign, others detach. Then there are the he-men, the bravado. These are the ones who say, well, hold your chin up. You, 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 you going to beat this. Is that just determination to kind of just grit your teeth and just by sheer determination you're going to overrule this thing that is crushing you. So there are many ways that people seek to beat their despair when the questions are how long and why and as he says I tremble in my despair but I want to offer you through the prophet Habakkuk another approach when God does not make sense when you are disappointed with him frustrated with him when in your quiet moments and you're not trying to be particularly spiritual or religious you're just trying to be honest with God respectful but honest Habakkuk helps me out helps us out in verses 17 to 19 of chapter 3 Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of the olive should fall, fail and the fields produce the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stall. Now, let's pause right there. He says, though the circumstances are bleak, all of those are ways of talking about things that are not working out. Fig trees that don't blossom, vines that don't have grapes on them, the olives are being coming from the olive trees and the fields are barren, not producing food. All that's bleak. He says, though, though this is the reality, yet, 
yet, verse 18, I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and makes me walk on my high places. Let's spend a few moments here. I want to center for a moment on two words. His situation is bleak. His circumstances are out of his control because most of these problems are tied to the fact there is no rain. And he can't make it rain. It's out of his control. You, you can't you can't do anything more to make it better. In our situation, uh, there was nothing we were not willing to do and nothing that was within our control that we didn't try. It was totally, we couldn't make it rain. We couldn't make it rain. It was out of our control. That's his situation here. But then he utters two words. Very important words. He says, I will. Now, stay with me here. He says, I will. But what he decides to do goes against how he feels. See, we've been already told how he feels. He's got all these questions, and he says in 16, he's in distress. So we know what his emotions are doing. They're, they're, they've hit rock bottom. No cattle, no fruit, no food, no... No, his emotions are, are, are flat, but he makes a choice. Says, I will. Sometimes faith and feelings get along. Sometimes you feel faithish. Faith and Faith and feelings have become partners. And you, you, you feel in this thing. This thing is bubbling up in you. It's, it's, uh, they're working together, but sometimes they get divorced. Your will must always be the engine. Your emotions must always be the caboose. The moment the caboose is pulling the train, your journey is in trouble. And that is because you can't always control how you feel. Feelings change all the time based on influences, impacts, circumstances, situations. Happy, sad, glad, mad, frustrated, irritated, exacerbated. You know, feelings are all over the place. You're crying one minute, you're laughing the next. I, I, I walked in the house, just, just walked in the house from the office. I think it was yesterday. I walked across the door and I just broke out crying. I just broke out crying, just weeping like a baby. I didn't plan that, that wasn't scheduled. But just crossing that precipice, I just broke down and started crying. There's another time, I just passed by a picture. And I just broke out crying. Didn't plan it. But the emotions 
took over at that moment. So you never, you can never ignore the reality of emotions. Emotions, how you feel is real. And you, emotions are never to be dismissed like they don't exist or that they don't matter. But what he did was say, I will. I'm going to make a decision in spite of my distress and despair, in spite of unanswered questions about how long and unanswered questions why, I'm going to make a decision. I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will do that. I have made a choice, as we would say in more contemporary language, to praise him anyhow. Not to praise him for what I'm feeling, but to praise him in the midst of what I'm feeling. I will praise him. Says, I will exalt in the Lord, the God of my salvation. He says, I will rejoice. Uh, I'm going to, when you read the Psalms, you see this regularly. David praising God while in the midst of describing pain. So he's describing pain. Psalm 42, you know, he's looking at all of the negatives, he says, but I will yet praise him. I will yet praise him. He, he makes a decision. When God has disappointed you, let you down, hurt you and you don't understand why and he hasn't at least yet answered your questions. The way I'm going to get through this, he says, is through my praise. And if I'm looking to my feelings to give me the motivation to praise, they can't help me because there's no cattle in the stall. <laughs> No figs on the tree, no crop on the ground. I, my circumstances won't give me the mm that I need. So you can come to church and if the sermon is right and if the choir is right, you can get a little mm. Get a little mm, you know. A little mm. But by the time you get home, That's because you are piggybacking off of somebody else. But he's talking about his own will. I will rejoice, celebrate the God of my salvation, even though my situation has changed. What is the result of this celebration? Because with the celebration, watch this now, comes a change of focus. He's talked about his problems. He hadn't, he, hadn't, he hadn't dismissed his problem, but what he has done is shifted his focus. I'm going to focus on the God of my salvation. In the book of... Um, of Job God from chapter 38 to 42 is describing how awesome and great he is to Job and how Job really doesn't understand much and, and uh, Job says in 42 he says I've heard about you with the hearing of the ear but now I've seen you with my own eyes and I repent in sackcloth and ashes. His God focused didn't change his problem, but it changed his perspective in the midst of his problem. Amen. 
what happened when he, by his will, in spite of his circumstances, got his praise on? Verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. When you're in despair, by the nature of its impact on you, you are weak. You're either physically weak or emotionally weak, psychologically weak, circumstantially weak. You're just weak. You get up and go, it's gotten up and gone. You're weak. He says, but the Lord has given him strength. Strength didn't come because the circumstance changed. Strength came because God entered into his equation. In your despair, don't fall into the trap of drawing from him rather than drawing to him. And then he goes further. Now get this, he's gotten strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet. And makes me walk on my high places. Let me read that again. He's given me strength, verse 18. And he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. The picture here is of a mountain goat or a mountain deer. He's talking about high places, mountains. You have to climb a mountain. The beauty of a mountain goat or a mountain deer is sure-footedness while they climb. They have the unique ability because of the strength in their legs to climb the mountain without falling into potholes or pits. They're able to navigate the terrain of the mountain. Now, I know we would all prefer it to read, and he makes my high places disappear. <laughs> I would prefer that, that my high places disappeared. I would love that. But what he did was, he says, what God did was strengthen my legs. Because he made my feet like Heinz feet. He did something with my strength. He did not cancel the mountain. He changed my footwork. both by strengthening me and showing me how to navigate the terrain. When you are driving and you cross a bridge, usually means there is something that's dangerous below you. A bridge is connecting two points of contact usually over something, a body of water, a valley of some kind, something that if the bridge was not there, you either couldn't cross it, or if you tried, you would plunge to disaster. Bridges aren't designed to eradicate the danger. They're just designed as a path to get you across it. The bridge that God gives is 
strength. And the strength, he says, is the Lord God, is my strength. He has changed my footwork and makes me walk on high places. He gives me the ability to climb this mountain and to navigate the terrain. Sounds a lot like the end of Isaiah 40, doesn't it? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Run, not grow weary. Walk and not think. They will, they will be able to keep going when in your own humanity you want to quit. I would love, I would love to be able to say that when we follow God, the mountains disappear. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. But there are those times when they don't. And you have to learn to become a spiritual mountain climber. You have to ask God for strength. But he got the strength in his rejoicing. Right now, and I know it's still early on for me, I have to start my day asking the Lord for strength for today. And to say, even sometimes with tears rolling down, I'm going to praise you anyhow. Sometimes I have to do that. I have questions, why? I have questions, don't understand. I have questions, why now? There are a lot of reasons for those questions that Time will not allow me to get into, nor would it be appropriate, but just a lot of questions. We all have why questions. If you haven't had one, keep living. There'll be a why question. And you, praise God, if you get an answer, because many times he does give answers. But there though, sometimes he doesn't explain himself. So if I were to entitle this time with you tonight, I would simply call it trusting God in the dark. Trusting God when there's great lack of clarity. When he has not made himself inextricably clear. When you have to wonder what he's doing, why he's doing it, why is he doing it now, why is he doing it in this way, why does it hurt so bad, why does it hurt this long? Praise God for those times when he gives you a clear answer, but according to Rebecca, praise him even when he doesn't. And let him give you new strength. And so, what I want from tonight, what I want to encourage you tonight, is to make your praise a way of life so that when you get into this situation, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start from the beginning because you, you, you're beginning your day just worshiping him, surrendering to him, and praising him. But it's also why we need one another. Because sometimes you need somebody to help you praise because it just ain't coming out. You know, it ain't, it ain't coming out. So we can encourage one another. So may God help us as we move forward 
in ministry as a church and in your individual lives. To trust 